<laughs> what is that about? Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to the Dean Callan Show. I have a very exciting episode today. Um, we have none other than Lynette Marrero on the show. And uh, if you don't know, if you haven't heard of Lynette and you work in the hospitality industry, then you must have been living under a rock for the last 10 years. Um, Lynette comes from working with uh, Julie Reiner in New York, who, I mean, you know, next to Dale DeGroff, Gary Regan, and, and um, who else? It's hard, to, it's hard to even find enough names in the industry that have that kind of worldwide reach. Um, she's one of the co-founders of uh, Speed Rack. We're going to talk about all this, actually. What, like, I don't need to do a big, long introduction. I've literally got her waiting on the line. Now, uh, before I do start, though, to ease my nerves, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut for the first time to my new camera, and I'm going to pour myself a Guinness, right? That's what, I should have done that at the beginning, but I thought it might be nice, since we did come on a little bit late, um, to give people a chance to join the channel. Um, I've seen other people, when they do live streams, do that, you know? It's like, this stream will start in five minutes, even though it was meant to start, right? And I, I watched that on other streams, and I thought to myself, why are they doing that? Like, why not? Do, we're waiting. And then I realized that numbers were going up, and they were actually just stalling so that there was an audience when they brought on their key people, which I thought was like, man, I, I, wish, I wish I had some formal training in this stuff. I would have thought to do that. And Diogo, welcome. Welcome, buddy. So that's one person. We've got Diogo on. I've got a comment from him. I'm going to get started. I'll top this up in a minute. Hello, Lynette. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you doing? I'm very well, thanks. Um, I'm a little very, I'm very self-conscious. Mind me touching my hair. Um, <laughs> I've, uh, I, I was going to wear a hat and then I just didn't, I just didn't know which hat to wear to look like kind of grown up, you know, being all official. <laughs> Um, it, well, I don't I, know. You're behind a bar. I feel like you know. It's yeah. it's like when patrons are at the bar. You don't can't have the hat on. You know, we're we're in a you know real time. I want to see you in your most formal setting. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's, well, it's lockdown, right? I can always blame lockdown for my casual attire. Um, Absolutely. So, how have you been? How how has uh, the 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 craziness that has been 2020 treated you so far? So it's been, you know, a little weird. I think the the day before lockdown, uh, I was in New Orleans. Actually, we were doing um, oh, wow. our speed rack, yeah, speed rack event. Our um, we were doing our seventh regional of our U.S. season, and it was, you know, every day we were adjusting to what we could do with the event. And at the end of the day, it turned into a very uh, just competitors only in a bar yeah. behind a bar setting, which is very not like our normal speed rack. It was it felt more like a rematch with two ladies competing on opposite sides of the bar. It was very, very crazy. But, you know, the competitors pulled through and then I landed right back in New York. And that's when things were it was I like, felt like the world was closing around me and I was like on a plane just like running away from it. Yeah. And um you know, I got to back to New York City uh, and decided to uh, close up my apartment and head out into the country and uh, wait out the the larger part of the storm kind of in, with access nice. to nature. So yeah, I've been got, very fortunate to the, have that. You got out of the small block apartments and... Exactly. Uh, and I've always called this the bartender sanctuary anyway for all of us to kind of get some headspace. Where's that? <laughs> It's just north of, of New York City, uh, about an hour and a half in the Hudson Valley. So, uh, okay, cool. it's a beautiful what? place, and yeah, not not far actually across the river from where Gaz Regan lived. Okay, that's what I was about to say. When yeah. I went out to visit Gaz, <laughs> I got on the train. He gave me directions, and he's like, "Sit mm -hmm. on the left hand side." I think it was left. Sit on the left hand yeah. side of the train because the, <laughs> the view is considerably better looking over the valley than it is. I was like, "All right." Like he, and you know, he's obviously done that before. The guy had been around. And he Hudson and West Point and all the beautiful sites. Yeah. So you, yes, you've traveled this, this far north. I went up. Yeah. <laughs> it's absolutely beautiful. And, and about three times I've missed out on doing trips to Hudson Distillery just because oh, of timing. And uh, I was oh, working with the Hudson guys for a while. Like not, well, I worked in the same company, obviously, William Grants. And yes. I hung out with them and 
done some market researchy stuff with them. And every time they were like, we've got to get you to the distillery. <laughs> yeah, are you available this day? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a little different now. We're completely available. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exposed to, but, but not for real life things, unfortunately. Exactly. It's got to be all digital like now. I'm, I'm just, if you don't mind, I'm going to quickly top up my pint. Um, so, <laughs> so have you... Um, you mentioned uh, speed rack. For those of the people that, uh, if there is anyone who doesn't know what speed rack is in the world today, um, for the people that don't know, um, speed rack is uh, an all for women um, bartending competition where you cre you've created a safe space for people and you're giving money to um, breast cancer, right? That's that's it in a nutshell. I'm super jealous of that pint right now. I'm like I can I can taste like the the deliciousness of a of a properly poured Guinness in, in Europe. It's not the right. same. <laughs> oh, oh, look at that! You got your little drawing on it too. Very uh, impressive. <laughs> I, I I used to work in Ireland and I poured pints oh, in um, in Ireland for about two and a half years and I worked in old men's pubs. Where it was just I love it. like I mean, there'd be two more Guinnesses on now, and uh, <laughs> they hated me putting shamrocks. Oh yeah, on. No. They're like, "What's this in the top of my pint?" So, uh, but I wanted to practice it because the American tourists that came in—they're the ones that tipped. Oh me. yeah, and they were like, "Oh my God, look at this! Look, he's done the thing!" And I'd get all the tips right. So I had it's to like practice. It's like when the barista it. puts a little heart, or or they yeah. draw like uh, I think like the the monkey. <laughs> the mocha. <laughs> um, well, I, I used to have to practice it. So what I started doing, there was um, a guy called Carl that was a regular that sat there every day and he drank Guinness. I started writing Carl in there. Oh, awesome. And then it would say, it would have like Carl and I'd be like, this one's got your name in it. You know, and they didn't oh, mind wow. that. So I've had a lot of practice. I love doing it. Um, I've loved seeing the beauty of like uh, of the artistry that comes through. I think if you want to have, you know, maybe the perfect perfect tapsters are, are just recruit in a. If you want beautiful cocktails, recruit in a in a cafe because the leaves, all the beautiful things that they yeah. put on your mocha latte, your matcha, like the matcha ones. I think I've seen people do like really pretty, like almost green leafy things. So it's been uh, impressive. But baristas for sure. I would I would hire them in a minute. Exactly, <laughs> and the speed. The pace. Speed. Yeah. The temperature, very attuned with temperature yeah. of the drink. So it's a, a good recruiting ground for anyone well, out there who's looking for it. That, I've started. I haven't given my son, he's only 18 months old, but I haven't given him any training in making cocktails at all. My wife and his grandma, so they've been teaching him how to make a Negroni and he can hold a jigger and oh. he can pour. But he, he wakes up every morning and he makes mum a coffee. And when Aww. I say that, I mean, he picks up the group handle, he puts it into the grinder, he presses the button, and now he's able to wait patiently until the grind's finished. He puts the tamper on the top. I have to help him kind of get the pressure he needs. He knows to put it in, <laughs> he knows which button to press, and he knows to wait for the espresso to finish drawing out. We haven't got to milk yet, but he can make an espresso. It's, he's just it's very functional. Enough. This is great parenting. Teach well, them like life skills young. <laughs> that, that's it. If, if, if there's anything we can teach him, it's, it's how to drink sophisticated without getting, you know, killing yourself, you know, because no one teaches you that when you're young. Um, yes. um, and how to make a good quality coffee and how to make uh, decent food, you know, that, <laughs> that at, least, at least he can carry that with him because we're going to take him out to fancy restaurants. That's, that's perfect. Our, that's our favorite thing to do at restaurants. I love it. Well, you're, um, I think it's important to train the palate from a young age. Yeah, yeah. He's had, he's had some pretty good training. The, the unfortunate I've had some thing is he's, yeah. also got, he's also got expensive taste. <laughs> well, that's your fault. But it's. I think it's important. <laughs> I was talking to somebody about... Um, you know, how we grow and develop and, and where your interest in, you know, none of us plan to become bartenders, mixologists, foodie, you know, people in the food world, not very few people are born and say this is what I'm going to do for my life. Yeah. But when you kind of start reflecting on the things that influenced you and got you there, and I was talking to someone, I was like, well, I'm like, you know, it's always just like we had flavorful food at home. You know, I come from mm. a Puerto Rican background, everything we had had flavor and, and compound flavors, not just one note. It was, you know, our culture is built with a lot of different nuances and levels. And so I, I really attribute to, you know, a, a good palate starting from, you know, 
my my mom's cooking and, exactly. and what she was making and, and also making us eat the food that was there. There was no special orders in our household. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that we're struggling with that actually because he just wants ragu all the time. He, he, oh, he, well, at least that's delicious. <laughs> it's delicious. But we're worried about the acidity of like tomato, tomato, mm -hmm. tomato, tomato, tomato. And he and Parmesan cheese, he'll 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 destroy that if he can get his hands on it. Um, <laughs> we're, we're, we're getting there. We we've we found that um, a, a stew like a, a slow cooked oh. stew. He'll eat the vegetables. It's like he wants the he wants the glutamates to have soaked in from the meat into oh, yeah. the veg, vegetables so that he's got that flavor um, and then he'll eat them. That's, I um, love that. Well, that's, that's, those are valuable lessons. I, I love what you're doing. Well done, yeah. Anna. <laughs> well, so, so I, I'm going to get onto some questions if you don't mind. No, so no, that, no. So that we can, we can dig and dive and find out more about how, <laughs> how you're getting on. Um, so you, you mentioned rematch. Um, we, we mentioned quickly that you, you know, you're, you're raising money for breast cancer and everything. Have you um, been able to adjust it to, uh, to COVID? You said like the last rematch you did was just before. And is there any plans for, for future, sorry, speed, speed rack. rack. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, you, you said it felt like rematch and that's why I got rematch in my head. That's um, okay. You know, yeah, everything, oh. you know, that are, you know, far from each other. Like, uh, I will I'll never forget the rematch round where Yale Van Groff, who slayed it and, and killed it. And she was our first year winner for Speed Rack. Uh, she's an awesome bartender now based in L.A. And, oh, yeah, um, I know. I know. I've met yeah, her. Yeah, amazing. I love her. Uh, and so, you know, I think. You know, that last moment, we have one more regional for the U.S. season and then our national finals. So we're two events out and, you know, we've had to hold. It's like, put our, you know, normally we would yeah. be full on into our other season. We would have uh, done another Asia this this past fall. We would have gone back to Australia and all of those things had to be put on hold. We were set to come back to the U.K. Uh, last June uh, with M5 Live. We were going to come out and bring Speed Rack back. Right. So, you know, we had to put all of that on hold. Uh you know, and it took us time. I think there is a bit of during this time, you have to make sure that you're OK before you can start helping others. You know, I think it's exactly. it's kind of the thing we, we often forget, um, you know, and so Ivy Mix, my partner and I both are involved with, you know, um, venues in New York. And so we had to take care of that house first, our, our teams and, you know, and that set, you know, and everyone, you know, we're like speed wreck and go on hold you know, we will figure out ways to help our that community, but we had to make sure that we were feeling in a place of, you know, just triaging our own businesses and, and, and the bartenders who were on our day-to-day -day interaction. And so then we've, what we've been working on the last, you know, we did some digital online content. We started working on a program called the Speed Rack Academy, where we're just working on um, giving a platform for past competitors to do some happy hours and get that mechanics of you know, doing cool. some happy hours, get them some dollars, you know, brands have been awesome about stepping up. But I think this kind of thing of doing online visual, you know, we need to give more people practice and get them. So we did, you know, an October uh, breast cancer series to raise funds. We did a holiday series. Uh, we are partnering up with a incredible organization called Focus on Health, um, mm -hmm. helmed by Lauren Paler and Alex Jump, who are two U.S. bartenders for Black History Month, where we're going to do another academy focused on that. And then in May and March, which is Women's History Month, <laughs> we are going to be launching a the Speed Rack Advisory Squad, which is going to be our formal mentorship community. Um, and we've had, we have Wonderful uh, women who have stepped out to be mentors from the UK, uh, from Australia, from Asia, from wow. our from our speed rack affiliate countries. So it's so, like a speed well, rack no. genius bar kind of thing. <laughs> Kind of, yeah. So we're going to do matchmaking, which is super fun. We have a group of uh, advisors who volunteer their time to kind of help put together. But we have uh, women volunteering from all over the industry. So, you know, like Hannah and Siobhan, who are bartenders, they're advising, you know, they'll yeah. advise someone on, on events and what they do. And, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's great. We have people in PR, we have people who are brand, you know, I think kind of covering all the different um, areas that you know, our community, our bar community might be wanting to venture into or different mm -hmm. skill sets they want to add on. You know, I think we're going to see, you know, the gig economy and bartenders. There's no reason why you couldn't work a gig in a bar and also then be a social media coordinator for somebody. So we'll have people exactly, to kind of teach yep. people that as well. So we're, we just want to kind of offer during this time that uh, 
that helping hand and what the community of speed rack has become is you know a community of of you know mentors who you know we all have our different experiences we come through this industry differently and if we can help give someone a little tip or a trick to help yeah. them through a little faster um and we're prioritizing bipoc uh community bartenders to also make sure that we are uh using that platform uh most effectively you're so busy it's good it's like <laughs> <laughs> I, I was getting i was getting fatigued thinking like what and what how would i find time to to do all these things it's it's really um it's interesting you pointed out that um you're giving bartenders um out skills outside of their core skill set of pulling shifts and doing bartending shifts because last week Declan McGurk you know he, he gave it he was giving advice to people that are at home saying you know look outside the box don't just sit on furlough and wait for that bar to reopen because you don't know what's going to happen um, and you know scale up or look at different options you know so for you to be doing that whilst people are slow in their in their work at the moment um, it gives them that outside skill that they might actually find a career in, or at least be able to juggle two different things, which makes it, I guess. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I think why not be, you know, multifaceted? Like, you know, I think everyone's at a different level and journey. And if you are someone who is a newer bartender, who's trying to work up the, you know, work up to, you know, beverage director, or those things, then you want to go back and or be a SOM or anything then you need to focus on educating in the liquid and, and those, you know, the WSET mm. classes and things that, or any resources, every brand education you can get to to start learning categories. But I do think that there's a whole set of, you know, we've been very lucky that our industry has grown so quickly, yeah. but there's a whole set of very educated, very talented bartenders um, who kind of have been through all that. They know mm -hmm. their basics, but they, you know, there's other skill sets. There's more business minded uh, skill sets, things that, Side of this community where you're going to be more valuable um you know brands have moved to digital for a lot of social media marketing you yeah, know a lot of people they're kind of they're boxed into it now aren't they really yeah so um, what's better than a bartender who knows how to put together like their media to them <laughs> you know like exactly and also there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of content to to be kind of tapped into as as consumers at home are getting more and more interested mm -hmm. in cocktails and learning more about them um a bartender can actually stand in front of a camera if they're good at speaking <laughs> yeah. and just reel off an hour's worth of content talking about these three cocktails that they're doing while people are at home making them because they've been doing totally. that for years across the bar with other with guests precisely right so, yeah, so you have they, this like performance angle <laughs> And, uh, you know, one of the a Speed Rack uh, alum who's been doing really fun things, her name is Janae Williams, and she's a bartender in uh, New Orleans. She's just managed to figure out TikTok and do these really awesome, very fun, you know, videos that are connecting to a whole new audience, right? Like, there's a whole new it's audience whole of new people audience. watching cocktails. And that's, I think, connecting to that is awesome. And she's managed to, her YouTube page, you know, post them there and is actually making an income during this time. So I that's think that's, amazing. that is important, you know, so how you figure out how to uh, just add to your skill sets and um, just make it, you know, where there's, I feel like as, you know, as we get into this industry hospitality, it's, it's kind of the things I wish I had. I wish there was like a three month course on business 101 when I got yeah. into this industry, it would have been awesome. Like here's your fast track to business yeah. school and the things you're going to need and, and pick through, but is, you yeah, know, there are resources and free resources. Is, around. I, I got that with brand ambassadorship. No one could tell me what totally. the job was. Like even the brand <laughs> managers didn't really no, because mm -hmm. my first brand ambassador job was 2006. So yep. that was like, it was so new. They didn't really know. I was just was. after you, 2008 is when my first one was. Yeah. And I'm just like, uh. <laughs> yeah, and we had to kind of craft it for ourselves. And this is kind of, this is what it, yeah. this, I guess this is what it is. Um, it's but also there's thing. all the jargon and language, right? So there's like, KPIs. when people tell you K K KPI. <laughs> but I, I so went like. like Six like, months with people mean? being like, "Oh, your KPIs. We need to. We need to set your KPIs. We need to set." And I was like, "Yeah, <laughs> who, who do I ask what KPIs actually are?" And it changed me as a person because now, if someone's like, "Oh, yeah, your KPIs," and I don't know what it means, I'll just be like, "What's KPIs?" Well, exactly. And I think there's like, how valuable is that to pass along? Right. And there's so many, you know, what I love seeing is that there are more opportunities now for bartenders to do part-time brand work to just even see if it's something they are even, even want to do. 
and you know and learn about some of those things. I did a class at Portland Cocktail Week one year. It was two years ago, and didn't realize things like KPIs. I was just rolling off all the you know, yeah. you know the letters and things, and, and people were furiously writing. I'm like, oh wait, do I need to go back and explain this? I and that was my light bulb moment of, oh this is valuable information. So hopefully through the mentorship program, though, you know, all of our brand ambassadors who are on there will be able to just kind of demystify it. I think there's also, yeah. you know, going to be different styles of brand ambassadors. So you have to also be honest with yourself and know which kind you are. Some people are like, I am the sales killer brand ambassador. Yeah. And some people are like, oh, that part makes me uncomfortable. I want to be the this, 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 show everything, do the trainings, and then let the sales rep come in and kill it, you know? So, I was more, I was more the latter. I, yes, I despise the contracty thing. That wasn't, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm like, I'm a hype man. I will get some brand, brand recognition in people's heads. And then you yes. guys just roll in and like get the sales. And that's what- Work I on the that, trainings, help the, yeah. Totally. Extendable spoon, uh, the the creation of the ice. I have, spoon. Oh, I have one of those. Oh, I, do you? I do have one of those. Yeah, I do. Cool. It's it's in my bar kit downstairs. But well, yeah, I have that. The, one. <laughs> the idea of that, it's cheap enough that we can just give them out to people without breaking totally. the bank. But it meant that people like if people wanted one, they had to speak to the sales guy because I was never there. I was I, I the sales guys had them, which meant that you know <laughs> there was a chance to have a conversation. Um, but I think I think we've gotten. I've gone off on a tangent. I was going to ask okay. you we went from um, mentorship to like working as brand ambassadors, yeah. which I also <laughs> did in my past. So as a full time and then a very short, I was like a, a very quick two year stint in full time. And then I was like, I got to get out and do other things. Yeah. But I stay yeah. a brand, brand advocate, if you will. I got hooked on. I got hooked on like I, I kind of felt I don't know how to describe it, but I'd spent years were earning no money as a bartender. Right. <laughs> and the only people that ever helped me out were other bartenders. So I, I, I kind of described it as like I'm 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 an atheist. I'm not very religious, but I have faith in bartenders and bartending. Yeah. Like I, I met several bartenders for the first time when they were applying for a job in a bar I was managing. And I'd have a chat to them and find out that they were going to stay at a backpackers, but they haven't sorted it out yet. And they don't know where they're going to actually stay. And they were asking my advice. And I let them crash on my couch. I didn't know them, but I knew that if they're a bartender at the level that they were talking and I could understand how much passion they had about it, they're, they're likely not going to do me over. You know what I mean? I just kind of mm -hmm. had faith. Um, but that, like, that led me to want to give back to the community. So when I got a corporate expense account and was able to take people out, <laughs> I mean, they had to drink my product and stuff, but... If I was able to take people on trips and, and buy them drinks and go to Tales of the Cocktail and throw big parties and stuff, I was doing it for as long as I possibly could. <laughs> um. <laughs> I, I think I found other ways. I think, you know, I, I didn't, I wasn't global and I was at very much when I did it for the two years I did it, I was local and yeah. that's where I think, it, you know, and they didn't have a national position at the time where I think that's, I just kind of very much identified for myself that the kind of contracty stuff wasn't what I wanted to be doing. Oh, yeah, and, definitely. You know, it's a very I didn't want to do that. And when you're and when you're local, that tends to be a lot more of that. And I was like, no, that's not for me. But another lesson, I left that that uh, company full time and maintained a wonderful relationship with them and have worked with them ever since. So I, I still exactly. work with Sakapa Rama on a on a on a global basis for certain projects and and so, but I do a lot of work for them in the U.S. And that relationship has maintained as a wonderful friendship and, and that's great. So it's not, yeah. I didn't lose them as a client. We just changed our relationship. And I think that's a really good lesson for some people. So, so um, you run, you run programs at restaurants. Could you fill me in mm -hmm. on exactly what it is that you're doing for the restaurants? Because I, I looked it up and I found like, you're um, championing um, South American spirits and bringing Peruvian flavors to, I guess, New York, right? Well, yeah, I mean, we're very focused. So I was, so I, you know, kind of when I left, so I did brand stuff, left that, kept doing brand stuff, but, you know, and I was consulting on bars and predominantly, but I kind of realized there was a connection point that I really fell in love with. You know, when I left Flatiron Lounge, uh, I moved mm. into restaurant bars and I really fell in love with, um, one, that was a, a move for me about hours and work-life balance and, and, you know, not wanting to work until 4 a.m. And I was like, all right, let me go bring my yes. skill set to restaurant bars. And I feel like, you know, it comes back to that connection point that 
I've always loved food and cuisine. I cook a lot and, um, you know, that connection point of giving a guest an experience in a restaurant and yeah. giving that. And as cocktails grew in that space, I was really lucky to kind of see how we grew in that space where we be have become a valuable asset to um, restaurants. And you see globally, every best bar, every best restaurant has a great bar program yeah, pretty exactly. much, right? Or they've at least added value to it. I got the opposite when I worked in restaurants. I worked with a chef who was basically like, the bar is nothing. And I and oh, yeah. wouldn't, wouldn't even give us star food. And then he'd eat in front of us. But we were on a tropical island, so we weren't allowed <laughs> to buy the food. You know, and I, I I eventually snapped and we had a massive fight. And then, um, well, yeah. and then we became friends. And when we started working together, I learned yeah. more in that short space of time than I had in my previous kind of years in the industry. Um, about flavors and different things and flavors techniques, techniques. yeah yeah well making syrups number one like I think working with you know and and there was that same thing in New York it was in my first uh consulting bar program that I put in with Brian Miller and we put in this great tiki program and brought kind of like kind of started that buzz again in New York and mm. um you know the program was doing really well and the the restaurant itself was okay like they just you know we needed to work together probably to change it but there was still that point of like we're not working together and i'm like you know we should be working together yeah. and so you know and we had to break up and that's okay and i learned a lot about that i was like okay well the next time i do something like this i want to make sure i'm working with um people who really understand i'd be collaborative and yeah. people people that five years ago. skill set and people that were yeah. that you can work with as part of a team yeah that's a huge thing but if I never did that first project, I wouldn't have started weighing my syrups, being more consistent, mm -hmm. access to different kind of ingredients, all those things, just thinking differently about flavors and pairings. And when I met Chef Eric Ramirez um, with the Llama Group five years ago, um, I think when, you know, it was a busy time and, you know, Speedwork was really taking off and I wasn't sure if I really had time to do a project. And I, you know, I met, we met for the tasting and I just think the way he talked about, uh, just his food was what drew me in. He talked about yeah. that he had learned so much of everything he was doing from his grandmother's cooking, uh, who had some Nikkei um, influence, so Japanese heritage in her family and his mother. And that led him to be inspired to actually cook and, and do this. And, you know, you see those, I love that that story and just the fact that he was honoring, um, you know, the women in his life who, yeah. who brought him to that point. And I was like, all right, we can work together. And then he was just very excited and he would talk about flavors. And I'm like, that sounds amazing. So I, I did the project initially that year with um, my friend, Jessica Gonzalez, who was the head bartender when the Nomad opened. Um, yeah. So she came from Death and Company and we worked on it together and we had a great time. And then I took over the programs um, and opened the new restaurant, La Masan in New York that, 20, uh, September 2019. So we were we just had wow. our one year anniversary, which has been a very strange year. But um, you know, the project really brought to together just so many things that I I feel that were the right time. So everyone, really pushing culinary there? drinks and flavors. Everything it's, it is it's, still there. It's surviving despite we, the COVID thing. We. We have been very lucky. The I have to say, uh, the leadership from Chef Eric and and Juan Correa, who are the is the operating owner, um, they have just led us through this time with really good crisis management. Um, yeah, and I think that's been inspiring, but also with empathy and care for our team. So wow. you know, I think that's like so. There's two hats. You know, there's the financial side, and then there's the caring for your people side. And I've managed to see the beautiful humanity in both sides, wow. um, and this how he's really managed nice. to do that. So it's great to be have partners who are that um, attentive to things and and aware and want to work together. So we've. We, you know, have been closed. One of our restaurants is open for to go. The higher end, Lama San, currently is closed right now, but we're just yeah. taking time to look at ourselves internally, work on, on spring menus, you know, look at our all of our documents and our training materials, and make sure that they're up to date and are looking forward to how we can improve them for when we all come back yeah. and what things are going to be needed to add to those. And then Llama Inn is still in to go, but we had a, a good summer. You know, we were fortunate with good outdoor space and were able to make that work um, and keep our, our bar tenders safe, which was good, and our, and our server. Yeah, so, that's a, you know, and, a safe and, environment. And no one, you didn't have any, anyone get sick or anything? Everyone was okay? 
everyone was okay. Not during that time. We had, you know, there were a couple of people who got sick back when, right after we, everyone got closed down. So kind of the effect of what was happening, um, but everyone recovered, which we're very happy about. Very cool. So, but you know, we just were chose to be super cautious and and you have to figure out and evaluate, um, you know, when you're looking at what you're walking back into and, and look at who the, you know, that the owners and operators have your best interest at heart. And Mm. I think we, I saw that with the team. And so I'm very proud to be a part of what they're doing. And then we've gotten involved in, you know, lots of different efforts to also help the broader community. Um, So, you know, lots, lots of charities and things have popped up everywhere for people who are locally. Yeah, that's really good. Okay. Well, look, I, I, you might have noticed that I, I am squeezing limes. Um, uh, I'm into my li- little shaker here. Um, so I'm preparing some lime and, and lemon because I'm going to ask you, I can see you've got limes and citrus there and you've got a uh, citrus press. So can you still hear me? Uh oh. Right. If anyone's still watching, comment so we can figure out if it's just if, if it's in fact me who's lost the internet or if it's uh, Lynette who's lost the internet. We'll bring Lynette back in if it is me. Otherwise, I'm going to keep talking until someone comments. <laughs> I'm going to keep prepping this, right? And hopefully we'll be able to get Lynette back on. Um, let me see. Now, am I frozen? Is it just Lynette that's frozen? Um, <laughs> if you can comment, that'd be great. Um, otherwise, I... All right, I'm going to go to Mitch's Minute, buy myself a minute. That's what Mitch's Minute is all about. One minute with Mitch. What, by by most interesting, do you mean like people that are putting fucking squid ink and drinks and microplaning sea urchins onto drinks? Because like those people are dickheads. Um, ing- ingredients for the sake of ingredients is dumb. Um, the same people that will give you a daiquiri and you're like, this doesn't taste right. And they're like, yeah, they made my riff on it. Like they can't even be trusted to cut limes. But as far as like compounding flavors and compositions. Um, Gabby Majinshik, you never say her name right, uh, makes awesome drinks. Uh, Keiko Tullock made really good drinks from up in Edinburgh. She makes really, they both of them make really delicious, deep, rich flavors. Um, Luke Ashton and Charlie Aintree, when they had this, must be the place. Some of the best spritzes of drinks. I don't, I, it's not a drink I see a lot of people make new ones of well. But for just using a bar, like with your basic juices and cordials and, and, and spirits, Chris Heistead was just able to make the best version of drinks. Or well, Chris Heistead Adams, as, as they are now. So, yeah. All right. Hi, Lynette. Are you back? Sorry, I, I, was, trying, I was trying to call you to get you to tell you I was coming back on. <laughs> um, Don't worry. But, uh, right, so this is, it's great to be able to cut to a video, um, which is why Mitch's Minute works so well. If you, I usually reset the audio and get myself set up. Um, but yeah, uh, we're back. I, as I was saying, I'm prepping limes. <laughs> um, I've got some lemon juice, I've got some lime juice, I've got some sugar syrup. Um, and obviously, I've got a huge selection of, of barware and, and different ingredients. And I was hoping um, that you might be able to talk me through a cocktail or how, how you would get me to build a cocktail with some uh, flavors of South America or Peru. Now, I also I just want to let you know that I only had, uh, as far as uh, Pisco, I only had this guy, <laughs> right? And actually, this was given to me. I thought I had like a load of different things, but this was given to me by my mother-in-law who went traveling through South America and brought this back, right? Does it say what kind it is? Is it machilado or quebranta or on the front of it should say what kind it is? Oh, there you go. Look at that. Right. So, so this is, so the reason I went and got some more because this is from Chile. 
um, and it it's it, it it doesn't it didn't say much on it, so I was a little yeah. bit like, oh god, <laughs> like what if what if what if the owners of the restaurant are watching and it's meant to be Peruvian <laughs> and they're like they're using chili and pisco, right? Um, so I got some uh, que, quebranta. Quebranta. Um, que, yeah, que, quebranta. Quebranta. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I've got some barso, and interestingly. Um, I didn't go out and get this, but I recalled, like, I've actually got um, an exact replica of the Bar Sol uh, stills that was oh, made nice. by their coppersmith. Um, but it's like a micro still. It's like this big. It maybe, may, it maybe holds 15 ounces in the actual well, still awesome. itself. Um, wow. And it's amazing beaten copper. Um, it was the first prize of a pan American cocktail competition that I did not win, but the guy that won it <laughs> sold me the trophy. Oh, nice. Really, um, the Pisco Oro? Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's so Pisco I, Oro, right? So I think this is delicious. Like, I think it's a bit more my style. It's more aromatic, yeah. but um, what, what, I'm in your is hands that a, here. What, what grape is on in the Oro? What's that? Is it, say on there? Is it a nacholado? What's the blend on your Oro? Uh... It's a quebranta. Oh, there's so you have both quebranta. Okay, yep. so uh, awesome. So both of those are quebranta grapes, which are um, part of the non-aromatic grapes of, okay. of pisco. So you know, there's it, pisco has a long way to kind of come with education, and we're we're excited to kind of get through because there is such a breadth of expression with the grapes, mm. um, which is really cool. Uh, so you know, quebranta is probably what you'll try typically find. Um, and then you'll maybe also find acholado, which is a blend uh, of yep. grapes and everyone has their own. Uh, I'm, I'm here with the Machu Pisco. So I have mine here. Um, so this is again, um, from Quebranta. So we're kind of working with the same and you can go with, you know, e either, either one of those two will work because it just depends on, you know, if you really like the oral, you're going to get the aromatics on it. Fantastic. Um, I think what I love about the category, I like using there's, um, Italia grape, which yeah. I really like, and I tend to use that when I'm it's working so with stirred funny cocktails. I didn't know I didn't know what the differences were, and I seen Italia, and in yeah. my head I was like, "Is this like? Does Italia mean that they're making it kind of with the with the must, and it's kind of, you know, it's a grappa style, or oh, what do I do?" Yeah. So I just went with the <laughs> one that sounded the most like I thought thought Quebranta. I didn't know how to pronounce it, so I thought this must be yeah. more legit. It, right. it's, it's your my, more it's, yeah, fair enough no it's more process. of your that is definitely your utilitarian uh italia and torrentel and muscatel um and abelia are aromatic grapes and then you have the quebranta and uh, negra criolla which you usually won't see as a mollar and uvina those tend to be more in the in the blends but okay. you'll see mostly quebranta out there um and then italia is kind of big muscatel is kind of taking off which is really nice um, so you'll just kind of get different aromatics from them. And that's what I love about it that, you know, the, the Muscat of Alexandria, which is also a grape that, uh, you know, they're, uh, they're making a Singani from, which is mm -hmm. done similarly to Pisco, but it's from one specific grape that grow that's grows in Bolivia at high altitude. Oh, um, nice. but where, you know, so that could also be subbed really well into Pisco cocktails if you find that, but we're working with, you know, the quebranta. So I think in a cocktail, it works really well because we're not working with that super aromatic. Like with Italia, I like to make really simple, pretty drinks, spritzes, or yeah. like you said, I like to mix it in stirred drinks um, that you're going to really taste it or, you know, so that way there's, because the nuance of it is a bit well, more fragile. Not knowing, not knowing. <laughs> I was it, I opened it expecting it to be like aromatic, like I remember Pisco yeah. being, and it wasn't. And then I was like, oh. So it just, it just, you know, I love uh, learning how little I know about something, you know, because then, then I know to dive into it. Uh, oh, yeah. If that makes sense. No, it's absolutely. Actually... It's a category I'm still learning so much about, um, which is really cool, you know, that you can keep learning about something. I think at this point we want to keep being challenged. Um, so kind of our, our theory with, you know, Pisco Sours are like the thing that sells. Like yeah. on the first menu uh, we had at Lama Inn, I did a drink called the Flying Purple Pisco, where I took purple potatoes <laughs> and turned that into a puree. And it was this beautiful purpley pisco sour so then i we kind of got known for making pretty colored pisco sour so yep. with our nikkei concept we use matcha in it 
Um, nice. And then we use, uh, we coconut infuse the Machu Pisco. So take some toasted coconut, let it infuse. Uh, we actually sous vide it together so that we have this like coconut body, which helps the matcha to adhere. And then we also use uh, some green tea shochu to really bump up those uh, elements. So we're doing uh, kind of that really nice idea of blending together the spirits together and also the ingredients. Um, but the, the trick with, you know, matcha, we, I know we were talking about your love of yuzu yesterday. Um, I think with yep. the pisco sour, what I love about it is that you can play around. So kind of the adapted recipe that, you know, anyone not in Peru uses because in South America, limon and limon red, they, they, like, you, like limon is, is little small line. It's not the same product here. So, you know, yep. we tend to, when we, in Western countries, we're trying to, to use uh, a combination of citrus to help blend it. So to give typically- it the flavor you know, of citrus that you would get in its home country, right? Precisely. So, yeah. I, you know, very much like back in the day, Flat Iron Death Go, all of us, Pega Club, were using a mix of lemon and lime juice um, in our Bisco Sour. So I, we took um, Natasha Bermudez, who is my head bartender, who is awesome. You know, she and I were playing around with different ways to like bring the matcha out. And we actually did do a combination of yuzu and lime juice um, to actually make our Pisco Sour. But we didn't do equal parts. We did more... Uh, you know, half ounce or 15 mil of lime juice. And then because yuzu is so strong, we just did about a tablespoon of that. So half the amount um, in it. And then we use cane syrup for a rich, okay. for a little more of your like rich, um, but if you have a rich simple, just the texture and mouthfeel, uh, you can also use gum syrup are, is really important in the piece. I've got some sour. gum syrup here. I'm just looking. That's going to work for you if you have it. I mean, if you don't, but you can use simple, it won't matter, but it, it will give you that extra little tip um, and texture. Um, so I do like that uh, as well. I, I, since I'm not at the bar, I actually, in place of my um, cane syrup, I'm using a uh, lime cordial that I made okay. um, to as, as a substitute. But that's what I like about this ingredient. Like I can go ahead and play around with the different ingredients. Uh, and so I'm gonna start with just, um, you know, 15 mLs or half ounce of my, um, my fresh lime juice that I did. Okay, I'm I'm coming back. I just no because I don't have matcha, I'm gonna yeah. go with. Uh, I'm I'm gonna try to mimic what you guys did. I've got a yuzu powder here that basically yes. makes everything taste like yuzu. So, um, I could put lemon juice in and get it, but I've also got some fresh yuzu juice. So I'm gonna actually. Awesome. <laughs> if you You're can gonna guide yuzu me this. on my, I love yuzu so much. Like I just I love really it. love it. Um, I think if you're going to use the yuzu powder, I think we should use that as a pinch and then yeah. probably use more of our lime juice. Uh, so um, either 15 mLs of your lime would be good and uh, lime juice. Um, just a, a maybe just a quick like, you know, I would even say like a very small, maybe quarter teaspoon of your yuzu powder, which would yep. be um, just pungent. gentle. That's the, uh, I'm using quarter teaspoon of my matcha powder, which I'm actually okay. putting my matcha in right after I do my citrus when I'm not using, you know, if I'm not using a blender or something to emulsify it, um, you know, the matcha can get a little chalky. So you want to get it in with as much liquid so I can get it. So I've got, um, I've to... got this guy here. Awesome. Have you ever seen these? Oh, those are great. That's a really cool heavy. I, I've not seen that. I've seen the powered one. I need that. You can get that them awesome. in like cheap shops in, in France, in like Carrefour's for like five That's euros. That's what I need. But honestly, um... it's so, I've had this for about six years and it's so oh, sturdy that. that you could, and it fits perfect in a Corico. If you, if you sold this to bartenders for 20 euros or $20, oh, yeah. they'd pay for it. But it's oh, really yeah. cheap in France. I love that. You have to get that moving around. So I'm just going to stir mine a little bit. Um, so then you have your 15 mils of your lime juice. I'm going to go ahead and add um, a little bit of, I'm going to put a little more of my lime juice. You can put um, a tablespoon or just, you know, like seven mils to 15 mils of your yuzu juice. I'm going to add. Put, sorry, where were we? 15 mils of yuzu juice. So, yeah. Uh, just slightly under so like uh i'm what's what are your other measurements on your on your jiggers so you want to do half the amount so if we did 15 mils of the lime you want to do around seven eight mils of, so, so half yeah yuzu not as quite as much because you just put the yuzu powder so we don't want that to overtake the whole cocktail although you're gonna have a yuzu bomb which is gonna oh be delicious my God, I like i just like I, I i will drink yuzu lemonade all day I've, I've actually it. got a friend who started his own yuzu lemonade in Japan. Really? German guy. Oh, wow. He's so cool. And it's so delicious and delicate and lovely. Like, 
it's uh it's pretty special you can't get it in the uk just yet though unfortunately oh man all right then we're gonna throw, put our um i'm putting in uh my original recipe is 15 mils but you want to do more um of your cane syrup here so just do a little bit more than that um i'm putting a little extra because that's also my secondary acid in my cocktail because mm -hmm. it's the lime cordial oh, i always see and then yeah and then 60 mils of your uh, Pisco. Sorry, that's two ounces. This is American pours. We do a big shot. Uh, I can I can do an immediate conversion. I like I like big shots too, so it's okay. Um, I, I like can do an immediate conversion in my head. I'm I'm good at yeah. the like 22.5 is three three yeah. quarter ounce and. 22.5. That's the one that I have. I have to get stuck in my head a little more. I'm like I I would really want to be more um, able to. Uh, do that uh when we did master class so master class with ryan chetty i was waiting to ask uh, you we, about this okay <laughs> great <laughs> he, he, i was like i really need to respect the mls and we talked a lot about you know we should in the book uh that we have that they give the the book after you get it after you take the class i was like let's make sure we put mls so i did have to go through all my recipes and, and then test them with mls to ounces and make sure they work um i don't have your fancy emulsifier so i'm going to go ahead and give a dry shake to my um, but actually, I build this actually uh, as Pisco Sours and talk about culinary influence in the masterclass because, oh, nice. you know, Ryan and I realized that we both kind of had affinity towards cooking, <laughs> which mm -hmm. I didn't know. I didn't know Ryan's mom was a chef. Um, I'm putting in um, now before I do my next shake, I'm putting in a little bit of a citrus salt that I made. Okay. So just a pinch of that. I used a citrus called Etrog, which is an Israeli um, citrus that is really intensely nice. floral. And I'm just putting that in there just to add one more note um, to balance the sweet, bring a little extra nuance um, in there. And then I'm going to shake it. And it's a citrus it salt, you said, right? A citrus salt. So I just took the, you know, I think right now, like it's citrus season um, in yeah. many places in the world. And so I want to find ways to like extend my season. So I am buying every weird citrus I can uh, using the zest and then cooking at low temp in my oven to get some citrus salt. Um, you know, cooking so much now too, it's like double purpose. I can put it on some beautiful salmon or trout um, and I can also. So do you, yeah. are you, you're shaking with ice now, right? I'm shaking with ice now, but I used a big tube, like the fancy bartenders. Have you got, <laughs> have you got, um, have you got any egg white in there or anything like that? I did. I yep. separated my egg white, one egg white. All right. I, this is, uh, I didn't, I find it's teaching bartenders versus teaching consumers. I, I, I miss a few more steps. <laughs> I've got my, That's I've got beautiful. my big chunk as well. I'm, uh, um, Bringing glassware uh, in the bar, we use something that's more like a, a, a lower glass for our Pisco flowers. Um, you can use a pretty, uh, you know, coupe or a fizz glass. Green okay. color. I might. What should I? What? What's? What does your glass look like? Let me have a look. See if I. I have this one. like kind of uh, beveled coupette kind of thing. It's it's a bit. It's a big coupe. It's it's quite beautiful. Uh, Redell. I also my glassware collector. Um, yep, I like so the glassware this. too. <laughs> uh, I might. Mm. Have you seen Remy Savage's glassware? Oh man, I've been following it. I'm like, it's so beautiful and so it's delicate. So good. <laughs> He's just and and do you know what? I've dropped his uh his so these guys here, they these gorgeous little oval. Uh -huh. I've dropped these from the bar, rolled across the bar, fell on the floor. I thought it was dead. Not dead. Still okay. Oh. I'm gonna have to reach is, out to Remy. <laughs> like, yeah, hey, yeah. I need to get your glassware here. Who's distributing the US? They're, they're um, really, really sexy glasses. I love that. So I have, I'm a big vintage glassware collector too. Mostly I have lots of vintage delicate things. Um, I'll show you one of my, one of my favorite prized little delicate ones that I found. 
these are kind of like this beautiful <laughs> just simple lines delicate yeah, nice. glass. it's beautiful with martini then these cool ones that are like very art deco with rye do, on do them do you ever do you ever look at some of the vintage glassware and think what happened to the sizes of modern glasses? oh yeah <laughs> like i I actually, um, I've got, I've, I, I, I have hundred. well, I used to have hundreds of vintage shakers and claws and I collect like um, vintage um, swords and toothpicks. Oh yeah. Like, so Love check it. this out. Like these are the kind of things that I've got floating about all over my house. <laughs> um, see, if you look at this guy, there's no way to get a proper up close of it, but oh, this I is one of my it. favorite mm -hmm. pieces. You um you set the swords up in it, and you oh, can actually cool. spin it. Oh wow! And then that's pull so a sword cool. out, and these swords are so like you you can't see the detail, but the level of detail on these things oh, is man. just you'll just send me like, a photo. It's oh wow! Next level. You can see there's like uh, etchings all the way through the sword and everything. That's amazing. They're pretty cool. I love um, that. I love these little guys. Um, I just want to make notes. So you did your double straining. My strainer, made by a bartender in the Midwest, Kilpatrick, has the strainer in yep. it. I know. So I've, I've, I, I always wanted to do that, actually. I'm going to have to buy that, Hawthorne. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so do you put like a dash them. of bitters in the top or anything yep. like that? So you usually use your Chuncho Amaro bigger, uh, bitters on, yep. on the top. Uh, so I have uh, – actually, I have some – uh, these are the bitter, uh, bitter sling uh, Kensington bitters, which are like the aromatic, and then just do a couple little dashes on top. Uh, I like doing lines. Like mine actually looks like Morse code <laughs> at the moment because like line drop 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 drop, and then a line, <laughs> which I kind of enjoy that it has that. I'm going to take a little picture at the top of that before I enjoy uh, it because I'm really excited. And we call this. Our variation. I may even I may even throw a tiny bit of citrus salt on mine, just so I can have that prettiness of the color. Um, you know, I think it's it's what I love playing around now with is how to find kind of uh, you know I was listening to Mitch uh, talk about the kind of cocktails. I love finding ways to um, jazz up and make the cocktail a wow, but without having to go too crazy. For me, I like either you know we normally garnish uh, this cocktail with a shiso leaf, but I have this beautiful. Cheers. Hmm. Cheers. Oh man. Oh, I haven't had a pisco sour in a, in a bit. Mm. <laughs> I, that yuzu powder really works. Oh, the yuzu juice as well. Is it like overly yuzu or is it like just about like... Honestly, I don't know why, but the yuzu flavor, yuzu flavor, ruby grapefruit and pomelo. Oh, yeah. I know that, I know that Ichang Papaya, I think has some like connection back through yuzu. And I know that um, I believe orange and uh, uh, pomelo are hot, make a grapefruit. So there's something in there. Yeah. That mouth numbing, aromatic yeah. flavor, I, I can't get enough of it. So a London Calling with yuzu. Mm -hmm. It's my favorite. Yeah, when we bat, I, I think that's why we use double acid in our, especially with yuzu mm. and sudachi, we were talking about these citruses in, in La Masan is because we're, also trying to work with the food, right? So luckily it does work with the cuisine that, you know, Chef Eric does a ton of ceviches. And so we can handle like a high acid drink. And I think that's kind of one of the things that I, I love talking about is like how a good cocktail can go with a food program and you're able to really um, tie it through. And that's been one of the best parts of working back in restaurants again yeah. at the time where we are now, where they're valued and guests come in and want to enjoy cocktails yes. and be transported somewhere and enjoy um, the experience. And I think we'll see that even, you know, at, at, at the end of this, you know, people, I think when, you know, it was a little nerve wracking when you're like, okay, I'm going to basically go on camera and teach the world how to make their own cocktails at home. Are we going to, are we going to cannibalize our own jobs? You know? Yeah. You know, you know, uh, when I, we're not. <laughs> can I, can I tell you what, what I thought when I seen the masterclass thing for the first time? So I'm looking at the masterclass thing and, um, I see, I see the people. So I, 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 I wrote down a couple of the names to make sure that I wasn't going to have a mind blank when I thought about this. But like, you've got Samuel L. Jackson, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Steph oh, yeah. Curry teaching mm -hmm. basketball, Gordon Ramsay teaching food. I mean, you can't like Spike Lee's teaching how how to direct films and stuff. You can't get 
bigger names in the industries, you know, like these are living legends. And when I seen that those are the people doing that, like, and the people take like teaching you acting, this guy is going to be your acting instructor. I was like, wow. And then I was asking around, like, how does this masterclass thing work? And I was in a conversation with Gaz Regan, um, privately, obviously. And me and Gaz, like Gaz was like, I'm, I'm trying to hunt down the people that run these masterclass things. I want to I wanna figure out how this works because we need to have it for bartending. And I remember thinking to myself, like, whoever does these masterclasses, <laughs> like, it's going to be a lot of pressure. It's like, um, I think when I first read Craft of the Cocktail by, da by Dale DeGroff, oh, like the yeah. old 2001, 2002 books, it, it was... It was a bit, a bit of a life-changing thing for me because the books, the cocktail books that I had previous to that, I, I never felt like I was being spoken to by a, by a, a wise old bartender who'd been through mm -hmm. bartending. And when I got Joy of Mixology and you read the oh, anecdotes yeah. and the stories <laughs> across the bar that Gaz was telling, I was like, right. So that's why on my back bar, I've got, Gaz gave me one of his bobbleheads Oh, but nice. I've got a bobblehead of Gaz, a bobblehead of uh, Dale DeGroff, and a bobblehead of um, Dick Bradsell, right? The oh, Dale nice. and, the, and the Dick Bradsell ones I had to kind of make myself. But my idea is when I open a bar, there's going to be like brass. The three wise men. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and well, it, hopefully by the time I open the bar, it, it basically it won't be just wise men. It'll be a plethora of different wise influences that I've had um, mm -hmm. throughout my career. But those were the three that, I, when I met them, I was, I was beyond, uh, they, they blew my expectations out of the water. Like they were super nice okay. to me. Um, super just, generous people with their time and, and um, with, with, and we were with discussing, young bartenders. We were discussing <laughs> it, but I, I, I think like how, how much pressure was there on you when you were shooting that series? And what was it actually like to be putting, putting onto film Right. Because, you know, the cocktail, yeah. it's one thing directing a, a movie um, or acting, but bartending because of the, the kind of cloudy, muddy history that we've got it. You know, what's written in stone changes so quickly. Totally. But, you know, ha, ha, sure. ha, two, two part question. How yep. much pressure was there when you were saying this is how it's done? And, and the second part, are they getting you back to update these things or is it done and done? So question number one, I had, I was probably did not feel that I don't feel stage fright. I was trained. I, I media trained professional actor I can tell. Uh, in my past. <laughs> and uh, that besides poor, when Ivy and I did our chat at poor uh, the year they talked about gender, that was probably the most nervous I ever was. Ooh. That was the first time I was the most nervous because what a platform again, something that's going to be streamed. Don't F it up, you know, like I was yeah. like, oh, same thing with this. But the good thing was I've had so many teachers and every teacher has taught me something different. And I think what we, but in the same vein, right? So it's like, here's basic rules here. You set up basic rules and caveats and ideas. And the whole idea is that everyone's going to change things, right? I'm just giving a, and I, and I say it in the class, I'm giving you a guideline. This is a, a this is a starting point and I'm going to give you the rules. And then I want you to completely ignore them because that's yeah. how we innovate and that's how we create. And so I just had to like give them basic good rules. Um, and I think what was nice with putting me and Ryan together was that there was, you know, you kind of saw how that worked, right? There's, I would, I chose to, and the, you know, they asked us what we wanted to teach. And I was like, well, I guess I really have to like lay down the principles and basics first. Mm. Um, you know, we originally, I believe we were supposed to be two different classes and they edited us together because I think they really liked how it worked and maybe it just the vision right there was kind of, oh, this is, does work in tandem to kind of teach you. Yeah. Um, so. It was nerve wracking. It was quick. I landed from a speed rack in San Francisco. I landed the night before at around 1130 p.m. in New York and had a 6 a.m. call time. So I was wow. went to sleep and woke up and just turned in. And it was it was a lot of responsibility. It was very much. Um, but, you know, working with Ryan, like we've been friends, but never got to spend that kind of time. You know, like yeah. we met, we've known each other from events and, and did spend some time together, but not like that. And there was just such an ease and a comfort and their team was just really awesome. I mean, due to COVID right now, obviously I don't know what their schedule is like. And, yep. um, you know, our, what our masterclass turns one years old in March. So 
Um, you know, we've gotten together to do some virtual things. So mm-hmm. we'll see what comes down the pipeline. But it's it was still really exciting. And I think, you know, we've had killer response from our our viewers and you know there's a big community online platform where we can read what they're saying and they're sharing and they're tagging us all yeah, over instagram with cool. their, their beautiful cocktails and it's been it's been a really nice platform and i could not appreciate you know an opportunity like that more uh, coming at the weirdest time launching right before you know launch march 5th and then we're locked down on march 17th so or March 15th or whatever it was here in the U S and um, and just to have that opportunity was, has been pretty life changing. Yeah, so I'm I, very I think, fortunate. It's good. It's amazing. Congratulations on that. That's, that's such a huge thing um, because it, I feel like that that's not going away. If that makes sense. Like, yeah, um, I agree. It, it, you know, if you, if you read some of the kind of stories about um, uh, Jerry Thomas, yeah. Right. Um, in Imbibe, they're talking about how Jerry Thomas wasn't the most famous bartender of the time, but he put everything down. You know, he set things down for people. And, you know, your Wilbur bartender, whatever his name was, was like <laughs> apparently more famous at the time. But actually, like, we don't know about him because he didn't he wasn't sharing stuff for future generations, if that makes sense. Um, so I think it's like a powerful thing to leave things behind for the next generation. So, yeah, it's really cool. Well, that's what we've been, you know, and I think that's kind of, uh, I'm very fortunate, but my career has been that way, whether it's, you know, raising up new young bartenders. Um, I think what I found, the the pride that I find now in, you know, working in my bar programs is helping my um, lead and head bartenders find their voice. You know, there's so much mm. you learn, right? And this kind of goes back to that same lesson. You know, um, you learn from one person and then you go into the next place and you bring part of that with you. And then I'm going to tell you, I want you to do it my way. And then at some point within that, I want you to find who you are. Yeah. And then you start presenting that. And that's how you, you know, you you figure out your style and what you're going to do and what you're going to say in the industry. So, you know, I feel like, I think I kind of took that pressure off myself. Be like, well, I might do something differently. Someone else, and there might be a great argument on Instagram about like, no, you actually do this. And it's actually this many milliliters. I'm like, and we're that worried about. Yeah. <laughs> the that Is it balanced? Does it taste good? Did we at least learn? that fresh juice is really important. Here's how yeah. you can do this with yeah. simple and things and play this. Is a, we play and every book you read is going to add like cocktail codex does things different than, you know, uh, more than the but we all have things that we've borrowed from each other and we've learned exactly. and globally now because yeah. of this kind of stuff, we can share advice, but we're all going to have our own way of doing it. I think that's the beauty of it. Yeah. It's super cool. There's not one way or else we wouldn't be creators. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and, and uh, otherwise there'd be vending machines in bars because everyone's Precise. got a different personality. Everyone's got a different style. Like people don't go to bars to get drunk. They go to, 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 to meet people and have engagement and not Absolutely. be lonely. So is it, yep. yeah, it's one of those things. Um, and drinks can are engaging if they're not always the same exact thing. Like no one, yep. no one opens a Corona that after having a hundred different Coronas, and then it's like, wow, this is the same as the last time. Isn't that amazing? Um, in saying that, right, I want to get off the drinks thing uh, because I'm, I, I really want to let you go. It's been an hour already. Yep. Um, <laughs> but one of the things I wanted to say, and I think I, uh, um, I, I, I wanted to kind of, um, uh, in a round, uh, without saying it in the wrong way, I wanted to thank you yep. um, for Speed Rack because I think um, I, uh, I, when I first heard about Speed Rack, um, I, I reacted in the wrong kind of way, I guess. I, I thought I was quite um, aware of how the world works. Um, but I seen like, I heard there's a competition just for girls um, and, uh, or females for, for women. Um, and I, and I, seen, I heard that and immediately images of like, you know, uh, everything kind of, you know, when people create like a, pink gin um that's mm-hmm. basically candied and is for ladies or you see someone create a cocktail and they're like this one's for um this one's more of a ladies drink and it's like what you know and in my head um i i used to work in a bar when i the the first customers that i ever ca- had coming through that stopped ordering really cheesy disco drinks um were were females ordering manhattans and you know like and if you look at the hanky panky and stuff so in my head Mm -hmm. i'd I'd never accepted that like these pink fluffy things are for girls and strong drinks are masculine 
Um, but but I kind of pictured this, this is what the competition would be. And I immediately got defensive and thought, well, girls beat guys. Like, you know, you look at your Hannah Lamphiers, you look at your Andrea Montague, yeah. the people, <laughs> you know, in London that just, they, they in open competition destroyed anyone that was uh, uh, competing against them. It didn't matter if they were a girl or a guy. So I was like, but girls can already beat guys. It didn't, it never entered my head that actually it, you know, when there's a community of bartenders together, there's a there's a bunch of macho kind of single-minded. There's 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 people with a with a bad kind of mentality and attitude, and and they have preconceptions of the places that what girls can and can't do. It just didn't enter my head. I didn't think like that. If that makes sense. Um, yeah. But I got I'm... defensive, and I think my outward reaction was one that today people would be like you what, you know, uh, what, what are you saying? <laughs> and be very aggressive in their response because today we're a lot more aware of, of the fact that there are problems and there are things that need fixing. So I guess I, guess I just wanted to say that I'm one of the people that was positively affected by uh, the actions you've taken and the work that you and uh, Ivy and all the other girls or well, women in our industry are doing to kind of raise awareness. And I want to say thank you for that. Oh, um, thanks. I mean, I just wanted to like put one little button on that is that, you know, when the, the thing was, though, when you had those times and it was the Hannah and the Andrea yeah. and they weren't surrounded. Right. So there's a lot of a tremendous amount of burden to carry when you're the one or two and creating breaking down those barriers and bringing more people in from whatever diverse groups makes us so they're not singled out in that mm. way and there's a comfort to being like you're just representing yourself and i think we're using this you know style of platform to make sure that we create equity for other groups that have been historically left out yeah. uh bipoc communities lgbtqia and make it so you're you know you're part of our full community um and so i think that's i i'm optimistic that that's where we are going and that's where we will um as an industry we are one of the industries that reacts and changes i think um quicker than a lot of one, yeah, a lot of industries yeah. can, and so I, I'm optimistic that the bartending community will uh, help make big strides in the next few years to make sure we have equity for all. And and do you still do you think it's gotten better? Do you think um do you think we're heading in the right direction fast enough? Uh, because there's, there's you can always still work on it. <laughs> yeah. It takes time. Every every country, everything is going to take its own time, and and that's okay. Um, but I do I do feel that we are in a positive trajectory, and that will keep Amazing. pushing. <laughs> All right. Well, look, um, sorry for taking up so much of your time and sorry for ending with like a really deep question or a kind of. That's OK. Deep um, questions I, are good. We should, if yeah. we're not thinking during this time, what else are we doing? <laughs> yeah. It, but yeah. I, I, I just wanted to kind of I wanted to kind of th thank you for that sort of stuff. And I wanted to kind of ex share my journey a little bit. It's 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 funny because I've been I've spent my whole life um, trying not to be to seem vulnerable at all ever. Um, or, or look back and say, you know what, I've had to change for this reason or grow for this reason. But, you know, it's I'm, I'm kind of a bit more aware of it now. Um, right. So thank you so much for being on the show. Um, have a lovely day. I know it's at like 2 p.m. where you are. It's getting late here. And um, yeah, thanks for coming on to the show. All right. Thank you. Cheers. Awesome. Cheers. All right, guys. Um, thank you for sitting in hanging out for a whole hour it's been um an awesome show as you can imagine um i'm still working on getting more concise with questions and having a more structured approach to the show but it was so nice to have someone like lynette who's an absolute pro um hanging out and chatting on camera and kept everything um entertaining and engaging um until next time yeah see you soon and if you do hang out for this long Try to like and subscribe and stuff like that. So there's more subscribers and likers and bell people. I see all the YouTube videos I watch where people say that. And they're doing really well on their shows and channels and have built huge communities. So it must, must work, right? Anyway, have a nice night. Close.